Let's begin with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for an opportunity to be here today to be a part of this worship assembly. Father, we are so fortunate to have our health and to have our, all the blessings that we enjoy. But Father, all, compa all pale compared to the blessings we have of our spiritual life, especially these opportunities we have to study. Father, to worship Thee, we pray that as we do these things, Father, we might glorify You. Go with us now through our, through our lesson this morning. Bless us in this time of, of uh, reflection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, and walks like a duck, it must be a duck. Right? If it looks like a Christian, walks like a Christian, Talks like a Christian, not necessarily a Christian. What we want to do in the next few minutes is study from what the Word of God says about the Christian. Now, in today's vernacular, a Christian can be anything. Uh, he, he doesn't have to believe in God. He doesn't have to believe in Christ, which is kind of ironic that a person could call himself a Christian and not believe in the deity of Christ. Or they believe in Christ as a good person, but not in the deity of Christ. So we have a little bit of a confusion in today's vernacular about what actually a Christian is. And we'll look at Acts eleven twenty six 26 in just a minute. The word is used three times in the New Testament. That's all. As often as we use it, and as uh, frequent as it's used in our uh, vocabulary today, in the Bible it's only used three times. First of all, Acts eleven twenty six. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, so it was that a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now notice two things. First of all, they came together with the church. So the Christians is the church. Secondly, they were disciples, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, let's go to Acts 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Now, there's two, two uh, trains of thought on that. First idea is that this is said in derision. Like, uh-huh, you th really think you can convert me to Christianity? But another train of thought is that actually he was contemplating and, and giving his life a, a reflection and trying to say, okay, well, maybe I do need this. Uh, or maybe somewhere in between both. Whatever he meant, he did say, and he did recognize the word Christian uh, being used. 1 Peter 4, verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in the matter. Let him suffer, or he that suffers as a Christian. You know, if you suffer as an evildoer, you're getting what you deserve. If you suffer as a criminal, then you get what you deserve. You look at Jesus Christ who suffered as a good person, a loving person, a person who had no sin. He didn't get what he deserved. And so Peter said, if anyone suffers as a Christian, in other words, if you're not getting what you, you want, you're not getting what you deserve in these persecutions and these sufferings, but you're being like Christ. So that's the only three times the word Christian is actually used in the New Testament. Turn to Isaiah 62, verse 2. Isaiah 62, verse 2. As I mentioned in Bible class tonight, we're going to be looking at Isaiah. There's 66 chapters, and I don't think I'm going to cover it all tonight. And it is full of prophecies. And it is full of quotations out of the New Testament. Notice Isaiah 62, verse 2. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. 
You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now, let's go back to Acts 11 and verse 26 for a minute. Notice they were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, notice in Isaiah's prophecy that this name, this new name, but which never been used, would be named by God Himself. This was God's name. This is God's name for the church. God's name for the disciples. Named by the very mouth of God. They were called Christians. The word were called there, those two words, that compound word, actually has to do with the calling of God. So when you see they were called Christians first at Antioch, what Luke is telling us is that they were actually being called by God Christians. That's what that always, without exception, when it's translated in the New Testament, that's the way it's translated. Now, folks, that's a significant thought. You might want to put that uh, in, in a side note in your Bibles. Because that word, we're called, or called in, in the, uh, the Bible, is always has reference to the calling of God. And so, in Acts eleven twenty six. This is God calling them Christian. A Christian is a believer in Christ. You can't be a Christian without believing in Christ. And when I say believing in Christ, I mean believing in the whole person of the gospel. Without believing that he is the son of God. That he had the power of God. That he was deity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among men. He was not only the Son of God, Acts 8 verse 37, but He was also the Son of Man. He was human. He had all the traits of humanity all the frailties, all the weaknesses of humanity, yet still maintaining the deity of God's Son. You know, in Acts 8, verse 37, as the eunuch and as Philip was traveling in the chariot, they came across some water. The eunuch asked the question, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, nothing if you believe. Now I want you to look at this confession real closely. Notice that Philip did not tell him what to say. This was on his heart. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. That's his confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then they both went down to the water. And by the way, he wasn't a Christian until he came up out of the water. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. He wasn't a Christian until he came out of the water. He had that belief. And now he was about to, to demonstrate his faith in the action of baptism. And once he comes out of the water, he is a Christian. Well, let's look at it like this. When we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27. So if we're baptized into Christ, we're also baptized into his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So when we're baptized into his body, the body is the church according to Ephesians 5, 24 through 25. So when we're baptized into his body, we're baptized into his church. At the point that we come out of those waters, we are added to the church, Acts 2, verse 47. When that happens, now stay with me, when that happens, we can call ourselves Christians. Because remember what we said in Acts eleven twenty six: They came together with the church and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It's a matter of deductive reasoning. 
Just pure, simple logic. So the Christian must believe and must also be baptized. Belief is from the heart. Romans 10 in verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made of salvation. From the heart. That's why I mentioned about the eunuch a moment ago. Philip didn't have to tell him what to believe. It was in his heart. It is the full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, James would have said it this way. Nothing doubting. That's that full assurance. We can know. That knowledge is a beautiful thing. If we are a Christian, then we can know about the realities of salvation with a full assurance of faith. We have types of deviated belief that we have to be aware of. First of all, there's just that mental acceptance of, of fact, which is probably, I'm going to say, 70% of the world in which we live probably has this mental acceptance of a few facts. For example, I accept the fact that I can't fly. I can jump off this building all I want to, but I'm not going to fly. I, in fact, I know I can't. But now I can assume, well, I'm not going to hurt myself when I jump off this building. Well, that's dumb. That's dumb. Anybody here want to try it? Anybody? I know through the fact of my body that when it hits the, you know, when it hits the bottom, something's got to go. It'll give. Concrete's hard. If I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ, there has to be an acceptance of facts, yes, but it's got to be more than that. For example, look at John 12, 42 through 43. We have an example of some folks that they believed in Jesus Christ, but watch this. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. There you go, they believed. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about this. Remember what we said a moment ago about belief from the heart and confession with the mouth? Either one by itself is not enough, folks. We can believe from the heart all we want to, but unless we're willing to confess like these individuals refuse to do, we're not going to be acceptable to God. If we're afraid of what others will think, and we don't embrace Jesus Christ as a Son of God because of what somebody might think, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our, our co-students, whatever, then we are not Christians. There's a dead faith, James 2, verse 26. Faith without works is dead. If we don't have an active, obedient, working faith, then it's a dead faith. There's a demonic faith. And by the way, their faith is as strong as some of the people I know today. In fact, if you'll look at uh, John two, uh, James 2, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well, for even the devils believe and tremble. Now, now notice this. Turn to Matthew 8. Matthew 8. Look at verses 28 and 29 of Matthew chapter 8. When he had come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, Now listen, it. this is the words of the demons. What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Here they believed and they even confessed. But does that make them a Christian? Of course not. They're demons. 
But they knew who Jesus was. Just because we have a recognition of, of fact does not make us a Christian. There has to be the life and the lifestyle that demonstrates that fact that we are a Christian. And then you have even hostile belief. Now, this, this one shocks me a little bit. John 8, 31. John 8 and 31, and then I'm going to look at verse 37. Then the, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you want to be my disciple, you have to abide in my word. Now, I want you to notice something. They believed, right? Now, this next conversation takes place with these same Jews that says they believe. Look at verse 37, folks. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They believed. How about that? But the word had no place in them and they sought to kill him. Just because we believe, that's no better than the, even the enemies of Jesus. Some of them believed. Even the devils, they believed and trembled. You believe in Christ, you've done well. Not enough. Bertrand Russell is, well, he wrote this book called Why I Am Not a Christian. How many of you ever heard of Bertrand Russell? He is a renowned atheist. I want you to read this excerpt from you, or from him, and I want you to think about what he is saying. In fact, he's a little bit sharper than a lot of my brethren. I think you must have it at the very lowest, the belief that Christ was, if not divine, at least the best and wisest of men. If you're not able, or excuse me, if you're not going to believe that much about Christ, I do not think you have any right to call yourself Christian. So at least you've got to believe that if he was a divine, that he was the wisest of men. Notice. Therefore, I take it that when I tell why I am not a Christian, I have to tell you two different things. Why I do not believe in God and immortality. And secondly, why I do not think that Christ was the best and wisest of men, although I grant him a very high degree of moral goodness. He believes in Jesus Christ. But he doesn't believe in the divine Jesus. And in fact, he says the Christian ought to believe at least that he was a wise man, but that he was actually the Son of God, that he was all-powerful. If he has the right to call himself a Christian, he said, I'm not a Christian because I don't believe he was the wisest man. I wonder who the wisest man would be in his thoughts. Confucius? I don't know. Anyway, But he does recognize that it takes more to be a Christian than just a mental acceptance of a bunch of facts. Now notice this. A Christian is a disciple. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. We have an imperative. Go into all the world, making disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Making disciples. So a Christian is a disciple. The action of this sentence... If you're going to make someone a disciple, you have to baptize them. That's what it says. Notice, I want to read it again. I want to, to stress it again. When you're going into the world, making disciples of the world, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how you make disciples. We've already talked about that a little earlier. Disciples being made through baptism then are called Christians. So in order to be a Christian, we have to be a baptized disciple. As we've established. 
Christians is a member of the house of God. Now look at 1 Peter 4, verses 16 through 17 that we read a moment ago. If anyone suffers as a Christian, tell, uh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin, watch this, at the house of God. What are these two terms that he uses in reference to the church? First of all, they're Christian. Secondly, it's the house of God. A Christian is a member of the house of God. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul said, I have written these things that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. Watch this. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. I've written these things you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. There is no doubt whatsoever that if we are Christians, that we are in the house of God, 1 Peter 4, and if we are Christians, we are in His church. And we have been baptized. Now, Christians are members of the body. Okay, now let's, again, use a little deductive reasoning. Disciples are in the church. Colossians 1 verse 18, the Bible tells us that the church is the body of Christ and He is the head of that body. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, we are baptized into the body of Christ. Therefore, the Christian is one who has been baptized into the body of Christ. We are in the body. Christian, if you have done these things, if you've been baptized, if you're a part of the house of God, if you're a disciple of Christ, then you are in His body. Now, with that being said, remember this. Here's the significant thing about being the, in the body of Christ. He has become your head. He has the supremacy of your life. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to the Lord who died for you. The name Christian comes from the word Christianos. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to this. The suffix enos means belonging to. So therefore the Christian belongs to Christ. Now, folks, this breaks my heart. But there are people who will only wear that title, and that's what it is to them, on Sunday mornings. You see, the word Christian is not a title. It is who we are, whose we are. We belong to Christ. 24-7, we belong to Christ. We are Christ's possession. Therefore, we represent Christ 24-7 with no days off. Verse Corinthians 6, verse 20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Notice, we are a composite being. We have a body, the physical body, the body you see, the body that gets older, the body that grows weaker. Then we have the spirit, the spirit that's from God, the spirit that will go back to God. We have them together. We already know from Galatians chapter 5 that there is this ongoing battle between the spirit and the flesh. But notice, Christian, both spirit and body and flesh belongs to Christ. That's why it goes on to say, therefore glorify God in your body. 24-7, that's our business. 
Not hit and miss, not occasionally, but 24-7. We belong to Christ if we are Christian. You know, it's amazing to me that this little word is used only three times in the Bible, yet it has so much meaning. It's so powerful. It's, it tells us so much about ourselves, just in the definition itself, about what it is to be a Christian. It tells us so much about what God expects of us because we call ourselves Christian. Just a quick Rehearsal of what we've looked at this morning. First of all, a Christian is one that's been baptized into Christ Jesus. And being baptized into Christ Jesus, of course, the Bible tells us, Acts 22, verse 16, our sins are washed away. You know all those sins we've committed? They're gone. No more. Washed. We're free. Romans 6. Now, being baptized, we're added to the body of Christ, Acts 2, verse 47, which is the church. And the body of Christ, we belong to Christ. Belonging to Christ, we represent Christ in our life, in our example, in our behavior, in our, in our language. I, I, I really think Christ is ashamed sometimes about the way we may talk folks don't you think for one minute that your, your speech doesn't reflect Christianity if we call ourselves Christian then not only are we baptized into Christ into his church into his body not only are we his disciples we are his possession Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. We must not do things with our bodies that would bring reproach upon the name of Christ. We must not do anything in our bodies that would reflect the kingdom of Satan. We glorify Him through our lives. Every aspect of it. Our spirits is His. You know, that even reflects our attitude. I mean, even by our attitude toward our mates, our attitude toward our children, our attitude toward our parents, our attitude toward one another. You see, Christianity, it just affects us in every way possible because we're the possession of Christ. Now, as I mentioned this morning, a Christian is baptized. And in baptism, we become a Christian. So, have you done that? Have you been raised to walk in a new creation, a new way of life? Now, Christian, let me ask you this. Are you living your life in such a way that you know that you are reflecting the name of Christ boldly in your life? Do people see that reflection, that image of Christ in you? If not, I want to challenge you. I want, I want, I want to encourage you. I want to Plead with you. Get your heart right. It's too important not to. Do you want to go to heaven or not? Bottom line, how bad? How bad? We encourage you to search these things out for yourself. Look at them. Research. Pray. But this morning, if you have a need that we can address, we encourage you to come always stand and sing together.